Good morning, comrades and, and friends, siblings. Happy to see you. Glad you could join us on this fine Saturday morning uh, for this uh, beginning of the final sessions in our Marxist school. Um, happy, happy Pride Month. Uh, and um, again, welcome. We are we are so very happy uh, you were able to uh, join us. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Cameron, who is assisting in with the slides uh, this morning, and uh, Luke for helping produce the uh, show, and Dee for helping us uh, helping us organize it. Uh, if you're just joining again, uh, my name is Joe Sims, and uh, I'm conducting the uh, class this morning on the introduction to some of the main concepts in the party program. Uh, happy Pride Month. Um, we're very happy to be with you uh, celebrating Pride. Um, Hope you're celebrating it uh, too. Um, I want to thank uh, Cameron for assisting with the slides and Luke for producing and Dee for helping organize our whole series of classes, uh, which have been a big boost in our ideological work um, as we get ready to go into the summer. Uh, season and this this uh, summer will uh, begin a calendar march uh, one year ahead of our next convention, which we are all looking forward to. Um, our goal today is to begin a conversation about uh, the party's program, the Road to Socialism its main propositions, how they arrived at, and the role that the program plays in the ideological, political, and even the spiritual life of the party. Yeah, I said the spiritual life, and I don't mean that in the religious sense, with all due respect to believers, but rather in the uplifting, uh, optimistic, uh, forward-looking sense that is woven uh, into the very fabric of our program document. So to that end, I will present an overview of the program's content, uh, its four main themes. Um, there may be more, but I'm saying four for today. And within those four themes, eight basic propositions. Um, but first, by way of introduction, uh, a word about what you might call um, the historical lineage of the party program. In other words, uh, where it comes from, its uh, root in the history of our international movement. And in that respect, our party's program is the latest incarnation of a rather long tradition in the communist movement that was first begun with Marx and Engels, who wrote what was probably the first published communist program, the Manifesto. Slide, please. Actually, the first two drafts of the Manifesto were made by Engels for a group that called themselves the League of the Just. They later changed their name to the Communist League. And the first two drafts were rejected. <laughs> um, the the uh, collective that was responsible said that they were, Fred's draft was too didactic, too, uh, uh, that, 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 that it lacked verve. They, they, they wanted a, a declaration, something that would rouse the audience. And, and so Engels turned to his uh, partner, his buddy, 
borrow Marx to assist. And Marx did. And, and you know, Engels was a very modest guy. He, he, he always attributed the major contributions to uh, uh, Marx. And so he said that it got verve, but it, it also got the main theoretical content. Whether that's true or not, uh, I don't know. But the manifesto ended up being published uh, on February 21st, uh, 1844. February 21st, 1844. Funny how certain dates uh, stick out in your head. And this year marks its 175th birthday. So happy, happy birthday, um, communist. Uh, Manifesto. Everybody's read the uh, manifesto, right? I imagine that's one of the first things that folks read. Do any of you remember the first time you read it? Think about that for a moment. I do. I remember it very clearly. My my uh, mom, may she rest in peace, gave gave me a copy. I must have been 12 or 13, something like that. And I told her that what, what prompted it was that I told her, if you don't mind a little story, I like telling stories, that I wanted to join the Panthers, you know, Black Panther Party. Um, you know, this was in the late 60s, early 70s, and we were all radicalized by the events taking place at the time, you know. Um, Malcolm had been killed in 65. By the way, that was on February 21st, too. I just thought about that this morning. Martin was killed uh, three years later on April 4th, 68. You know, there was the anti-war movement. Uh, there was the uh, civil rights movement, SNCC. Uh, uh, there was uh, SDS and the Young Lords and the Panthers, uh, you know, going up against the police and it was the last poets, all of that, you know, and, 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 and we very much admired the Black Panther Party, you know, Huey and Bobby Seale and Kathleen and uh, Erica Huggins and Elaine Brown and them. And, and uh, um, so, I, I I told mom, I, I want to join the Panthers. We were all Panthers back then, at least spiritually. And her response was to give me a copy of the manifesto. And I remember taking it downstairs into the basement where I was sleeping at the time and opening up that pamphlet. And boy, I tell you, I was rocked by the opening lines. Um, you know, the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle, and, and then it went on. Um, let's stop for a, a moment. What are some of the main propositions of the manifesto? There, there are um, um, some main theoretical concepts that were put forward then that last until today. Luke, could you open up the mic? Could, could y'all want to just share some of the main ideas that emerged from the manifesto? We'll take one or two. All and right. So if you'd like to comment, please uh, click the icon of the raised hand to raise your hand at which point I will call your name and open your mic. All you have to do is open your mic on your end to begin speaking. Um, please keep your comment to one minute or less. All right. Still looking for raised hands. All right, Wayne, I'm going to open your mic now. If you could just open your mic on your end. There you go. Yeah, um, I think um, one of the key points is that uh, under capitalism, everything is constantly changing. The uh, 
expression, I think, is all of that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned. This idea of continual revolutionizing of the means of production. Very good. All right. I'm looking for more raised hands. Looks like that is all at the moment, Joe. Okay. That's good. Change. You know, everything is in a state of change. Uh, and and uh, part of that change is the change of history. Uh, I, I would argue that there are three main ideas uh, that are put forward in the uh, manifesto. Uh, slide, please. One is that the class struggle is the motive force of history. I hinted at it before. I'm actually, I more than hinted at it. The history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle. That's the main proposition of historical materialism. Secondly, um, the leading role of the working class, leading role of the working class. Remember what they said in that opening paragraph? Of all the classes standing face to face with the modern bourgeoisie, the working class is the only really revolutionary class, you know? Lenin said later that if you don't get but one idea in Marx, that should be the idea that you should hold on to. Um, it's the most important idea in Marx, a leading role of the working class in the fight for a new society. Third idea, um, workers of the world unite, right at the end, right? Um, you ain't got nothing to lose but your chains. You got a world to win, right? The concept of working class internationalism. Um, and, and here's um, an important uh, historical and theoretical note might be a little controversial, but that's all right. Um, and that is that Lenin, in his genius, some years later, added to the formula, didn't he? What did he add? He said, workers and oppressed peoples of the world unite. You don't have nothing to lose but your chains. And many people don't realize this, but when Lenin added oppressed peoples to the slogan, he added something new. Um, what was he talking about? Because remember now we're dealing with the age of imperialism. We're dealing with the age of the division of the world amongst the major capitalist powers, you know? In 1885, uh, the European powers carved up the African continent. You know, later they carved up China, uh, carved up Latin America. And, 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 and in the era of imperialism, uh, the, the rights of uh, nations to self-determination became a major issue, particularly after World War I. And by extension, the rights of all people to equality. And, 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 and when you talk about the right to self-determination of nations and the rights of people to equality, what are you talking about? You're talking about, when you talk about rights, you're talking about democracy, right? And so Lenin now has, has put the struggle for democracy um, right in, um, he has married it, right? To framed by class, now framed by class, to the struggle. These two issues now are joined, kind of joined at the hip. And it's been um, that way ever since. 
The manifesto and the party program have a lot of similarities. Both are um, elaborations of our general views and beliefs. Both serve as a roadmap or guide of getting to where we want to go. And both are based on a scientific outlook, a, a materialist conception of the real world. Not the world as we imagine it or want it to be, but the world as it actually is. And both are products of a collective process. Now, I don't know if the manifesto was ever voted on, but it, they did, as I indicated a few minutes ago, get some uh, feedback. Our program, y'all, is very much the product of a collective process. Collective writes it. It's submitted to the leading collectives of the party for discussion. Um, national meetings are, are held to uh, discuss it. Uh, clubs discuss it, district committees, there are written contributions, uh, podcasts, uh, all of this is part of our pre-convention discussion, which takes place four months before the convention. And then it's debated at the convention and, and voted on. And, and if there's a high level of unity uh, on it, the discussion has been thorough, it's adopted. But if not, you know, it's tabled. Um, in 1968, the uh, party program had been tabled from the previous discussion. That program was under discussion for eight years. They, they had trouble agreeing on some of the major propositions uh, therein. Um, but once the convention agrees and votes on it, um, it becomes a binding document. And, and, and as a binding document, it has all the force that our collective strength can muster. And what the convention votes on and brings together, let no person tear asunder. That don't mean that, that every letter or comma or period um, uh, is set in stone, but it does mean that this is our official collective product that we've worked on and amended and agreed to. It is our official statement and, and, and guide. And if you want to change it, you have to do so in accordance with the same process by which it was adopted. In other words, by the collectives that initiated it. You just can't come into the party and say, I like the party, but I don't like the program. Or I like this section of the program, but I ain't feeling this other one. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna agree to work on in that particular area of struggle. No. Um, in fact, the, the, the program says at the beginning, if, if you like and agree with this program, we invite you to join. If you don't like it, well, you know, you got options, right? So let's move on. There are four um, main uh, themes to the program. Slide, please. Um, the first is uh, the class struggle and the working class. That's the central theme that runs throughout the uh, program. Second um, theme is the struggle for democracy. Struggle for democracy, equal rights. Um, the third major theme is the United Front, 
you know, people's front, anti-monopoly strategy. And the fourth is addresses the role of the party. Um, and if you think about these four themes, uh, they are uh, parts of an integrated whole, each relating to and penetrating with, connected uh, with the other. They represent a, what you might consider to be a dialectical whole. We'll come back to that at the conclusion of our uh, discussion. Maybe it'll be clear uh, about what I'm talking, what I'm trying to, to uh, say here. Let's take the first uh, issue, um, class struggle uh, and the working class. First proposition, I said that there are eight. This is proposition number one, in case you're taking notes. Um, and this has to do uh, with, with the heart of the class struggle, where the class struggle originates. What, what, what is its basis? What is its economic, uh, if you will, basis? Let's put that question to um, the participants in the webinar. What is the economic basis of the class struggle? Where, where does it come from? Luke, you want to open the mic and see if anybody um, wants to all right so just click the raised hand icon to raise your hand at which point i will call on you and open your mic all you got to do is open your mic on your end to make a comment uh all right i'm gonna call on jim i'm opening your mic now jim just open there you go. yeah yeah can you hear me yep hello okay great uh the question is, uh, what is the, uh, what constitutes the class component? Is that correct? What is the economic basis of the class struggle? Where does it take place in its primary form? Well, I guess uh, what, yeah, what, where does it take place would be, uh, well, workers, work, working class people, those who have a, uh, who do not own the means of production, I guess, would be sort of the central um, central field of class struggle. Right. All right. Workers are the central field of the class struggle. Very good. Anything else? Okay. Peggy. Oh, should I call in another can another uh, question or no? Sure. All right, Peggy, I'm going to open your mic now. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, yes, um, we're uh, between between capital and labor, and labor using the old term of proletariat, uh, those who have nothing to sell but their labor power. And also, mm -hmm. this has been puzzling me and bothering me a lot lately. It's where surplus value is created and yet we have a huge need for the labor of people who aren't creating surplus value and who are really essential and i i, I really would like to see that addressed thank you very much both of you have uh, hit the nail on the head the most basic struggle under capitalism is the fact the division of the work day, right? Who gets what? Workers or the capitalists? You work eight hours, 10, 12, you know, overtime. Who appropriates the greater part of that value? Workers want pay increases. We want health care coverage. We want slow down production. Capitalists want to speed it up. We want break time. We want vacation time. And the company, uh, wants actually is compelled uh, to give back the lowest amount possible, right? They have to maximize profits. Um, 
The program puts it this way, and I quote, slide please. The working class is compelled to resist increased exploitation. And by exploitation, they mean the appropriation of the surplus value. It seeks to improve living conditions by increasing workers' share of the new value they create at the expense of the capitalists. End of quote. Take, for example, um, the uh, railroad workers, right, last fall. Everybody remembers that whole big thing that took place. Workers wanted to go on strike and, and uh, Congress and, and uh, the president intervened after several months of uh, negotiations. And, and, and the unions wanted 15 days and they had none, they had no sick days. You know, the standard in industry is three, four maybe, you know? Um, and, and the company was loath to give them any. Um, and, and then uh, Bernie and Sherrod Brown and uh, Ilhan and Rashida Tlaib and A.O. State, they said, okay, well, let's give them seven. Um, and, uh, and then Biden intervened and said, you can't strike because it's before Christmas. And I don't want the economy to get wrecked. And, and uh, it was that whole big, and, 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 and finally, um, while the right to strike was pushed to the side, two or three of the corporations, the railroad agreed to give two, three days. You know, one steel worker told me, he said, Joe, the company would rather give up money for, uh, uh, give up money give, than give days off. They would rather give pay in increases than give days off. Why? Because if you uh, give days off, you have to hire more workers to compensate, right? And that would lower the rate of profit, which they can't contemplate because this is capitalism. And capitalism <clears throat> is a dog-eat-dog -dog system, you know? One dog eats the other dog, you know? It's make the maximum profit um, in order uh, to survive. So this is the uh, first uh, important uh, proposition of the uh, program, that the part of the class struggle takes place at the point of production, um, and that that fight is over the division of the working day. Who gets, who gets what? Um, and that that fight is inevitable until the expropriators of labor are expropriated themselves. Proposition number two, if you're taking notes, is that there are three basic forms of the class struggle. Um, what are they? Our program says there are three. Does anybody know? Luke, you want to open the mic? Just raise your hand if you'd like to answer this question, uh, and I will call on you. All you need to do is open your mic. Um, looking for raised hands. Ugo, I'm going to open your mic. There you go. Okay. Sorry, uh, uh, my hand's left up from the last uh, question. Oh, I'm session. I'm call um, Larry. I'm opening your mic now, Larry. Larry closed their mic, so I guess, uh, oh, there you go, Larry. Yes, okay. I think one aspect, a challenge for all of us is to recognize the changing nature of production, whereas it used to be on factory lines with a simple uh, uh, wage structure and large employers. Nowadays, we face the AI, artificial intelligence. We face the intellectual workers, so to speak, at uh, Amazon and all these big corporations 
and still the workers get a paychecks uh, coming from large monopolistic employers, national or international. And so uh, our coming task, I think, is to keep up with these technological changes uh, occurring, of course, way before Marx and Engels. And this, the party is equipped, I believe, through input and um, democratic priorities to organize workers where class consciousness right now seems to be, let's say, relatively low in terms of uh, union organization. So I mention this, uh, especially for young as well as older comrades to go forward with modern times. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, anybody else? All right, if you would like to comment, just raise your hand. Looks like that is all the hands. Okay. Um, our our slide, please. Um, their their uh, program argues that there are three primary forms of the class struggle. First is economic, which we've already talked about. Um, fight over wages, fights around health and safety, fights around sick days, um, fights around you know, vacation time, so on and so forth. That's the first form. Trade unions are generally organized around that. Second form is political, right? Voting rights, uh, collective bargaining rights, those, the economic and the political here interpenetrate, criminal justice, um, marriage equality, uh, immigration. That's the third form is ideological, right? Battle of ideas, uh, uh, critical, critical race theory, you know? What is the family? Um, Engels uh, critiqued the bourgeois family, if you remember. But, but how do we define the working class family? It's not the same. Um, what is freedom? You know, what is liberty? Freedom for the bourgeoisie is the absence of, at least it arose around the absence of restraint to trade that were imposed by the old feudal monarchies. They want free trade. Freedom for the working class means freedom, our point of departure is freedom to collectively bargain. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's where we start. And the companies don't like that at all. That's why they can't uh, pass the uh, PRO Act. What is global warming? Is it heating up uh, the earth or not? Republicans say no. It must have not been in New York City last week when no fires from Canada came over the city and cast everything in a red and orange haze. Another big ideological battle is what's best, socialism or capitalism, right? Those are so so our program argues that there are three um, basic uh, forms of the class struggle, uh, which leads us to the third major proposition of the party program. And that is that the working class that is produced in this class struggle, that is forged by this class struggle, is objectively a single unitary class formation. In other words, the program argues that the process of production has produced only one working class in these United States. They're not two working classes or three working classes, but one U.S working class in this multiracial, multinational, multi-gendered country. 
But the ruling class and its propagandists put up all kinds of smoke screens and, and, and uh, trickery the masters at uh, what you might call technology to confuse us about this issue. For example, their theorists put forward the notion of the underclass. What the hell is that? A academic by the name of Charles Murray um, of infamous bell curve fame was the first person to introduce this idea into the lexicon um, back in the 70s, I think it was. Y'all remember that, the bell curve, which was one of these um, pseudo-scientific uh, attempts to prove that uh, people of color are you know, intellectually inferior to whites. And they they tried to do it by graphing these IQ scores and they went in a bell curve. And at the bottom of the curve were uh, Black, Latino, Native, Native American, and uh, so on. Um, first, to introduce concepts of underclass, Murray. It was later picked up by an African-American sociologist. I believe his name was William Julius Wilson, who later abandoned it, thankfully. But what is, I mean, how do you, what's the scientific basis for determining who this underclass is? Is it black people or Latino? Is, it, is there a racial? Well, if you don't like that, you know, who is it like drug addicts um, or hookers or, you know, uh, hustlers, boosters? Y'all know what boosters are? Back home, we call people who go into stores and, sh and shoplift, <laughs> call that boosting. Uh, people in prison, is that who? You know, underclass. Well, what the hell is that? Or, 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 or they divvy the working class up and they divide it into different parts. That's what one of the contemporary. You know, they're always talking about the white working class. You know, or the black working class, or the Latino working class, uh, but mainly the white working class. You hear that a lot on CNN or on Fox or, or M MSNBC. But who who is that? Are those the Trump people? But then if, if it's the Trump people, who, who the people who don't support Trump and are white, wh where do they fit? You know, <laughs> after class, when you have a little bit of time, go to Google Images and type in working class and see what comes up. And I bet you for every one interracial picture, you'll find four, okay, three to five images of Trump rallies, white working class. I don't know how they calculated that algorithm whether that was a human or um, Larry mentioned AI, AI, but whoever it was was pretty damn stupid if you ask me. Let, let, let's talk about how from a Marxist Leninist perspective, how class is status is determined not only in this country, but around, around the world. How, do, how does Marxism define class? Does anybody know, Lou? 
All right. <clears throat> if you'd like to answer this question, please just raise your hand. Use the raised hand icon to do so, at which point I will unmute you. All you've got to do is uh, unmute yourself on your end. I'm going to call on Jim. Jim, I'm unmuting you now. Yep. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Great. Yeah, me again. Um, well, I think my previous answer kind of also answered it, which is that um, your relation to the means of production is how we define class as Marxists. Um, and then I think to the when we, when we get into the second uh, form of class struggle shown on the slide, then we're, we're looking at how the ruling class tries to divide up that uh, those people in the working class who have that relationship to the means of production. They try to divide them up into uh, you know, different groups in order to super exploit certain groups, whether they be racial groups or uh, people who identify uh, differently according to gender or women or immigrants or any sort of um, subclass that the, uh, that the bourgeoisie wants to define. They do that in order to break our unity as a class because ultimately our class position is based on the fact that we all earn our primary income and our living by our wages, not our, well, and also the unemployed, I, I guess I didn't want to leave them out because we were sort of talking about that, but the unemployed are the uh, reserve armies of labor as Marx defined it. And so they are ultimately still working class. They are not underclass. They are not um, some other uh, class. They are part of the working class and they are used to also be super exploited essentially. Good. Class is, uh, we argue that class is determined by relationship to production. Absolutely right. Not by income, not by whether you're employed or unemployed, but whether you're a seller of your ability to work or a buyer of it. If you're a seller of it, you're a worker. If you're a buyer of it, you're a capitalist, you know, you're bourgeois. If you employ between five and say 500 workers, you're <coughs> um, a, a small capitalist, well, 500 closer to becoming a medium-sized capitalist. You're petty, petty bourgeois, you know? You got five, you're petty, petty bourgeois. If you got 100, you're, you're petty bourgeois. Uh, if you employ between 500 and say 5,000, well, you know, you're, you're doing it then. Um, the, but, but, but if you're selling your ability to work, uh, you're a worker. And, and the vast majority of people in this country are workers. It's not just people who work in a factory, right? It's, it's teachers. It's nurses, it's retail workers, but it's also doctors and, and engineers and architects and professors and, and graduate students and so on and so forth. And you see that with the growing organizing drives that are taking place in these um, different occupations. Capitalism is driving everybody into the ranks of the working class. There's a constant downward pressure on wages. Um, we call that the process of proletarianization. Um, slide, please. Um, now, there's one working class in this country, but, and this is important, it's affected by a racial or racist and gender or sexist based social division of labor. And by social division of labor, that's a fancy way of saying that people are relegated to uh, different occupations. 
because of the history of racism and sexism, set uh, uh, separate occupations. You know, you go to a mall or a grocery store, uh, you know, who, who do you see working as cashiers? Black, brown, right? Uh, security, um, black, brown, custodial, black, brown. Go to the hospital. I, I, I'm always, you know, uh, struck when I, I go to the hospital, you know, in reception, black, brown, again, security, black, brown, custodial, black, brown. And some of the tech, you know, you get x-rays, black, brown, MRI, or CAT scan, you know, black, brown. Nursing, it's a little more mixed, black, brown, Asian, white, you know. But the higher you go up, um, doctors, mainly white, some black, not too many, Asian, Latino. Further up the elevator, administrators, owners, do I need to say it? Or, or, or think about who does home care for the elderly, right? Mainly women, mainly Black, Latino, Asian. In New York, there's a big campaign because they got them working 24 hours a day. Can you believe that? 24 hour shifts. Or, or in the home, you know, who, who is relegated to work in the home? Women, in, in what Marxism calls the reproductive sphere, the vast majority of unpaid work done by women. That's why we say we need wages for housework. Which, which, which brings us to the next proposition. This is proposition number four, if you're uh, keeping count, that fighting um, racism and sexism is central to achieving class unity. Our program, uh, puts forward a very important and very nuanced presentation of the relationship between the class struggle and the struggle for democracy. It argues that capitalism has forged a single working class in this multi-racial country, right? That it, in doing so, tears down division. It compels a common language. It, it forces workers to combine and, and form unions in order to survive. But at the same time, simultaneously, it pulls us apart, right? Redlining uh, pushes us in separate communities, uh, compels us to attend separate schools, um, I mean, and I mean compels. You try sending your kid to a school in another district, take your behind straight to jail, like that did that woman in Ohio a couple of years ago, all because she wanted her child to go to a decent school in the suburbs. It convinces us to bury our dead in separate cemeteries, worship, deities in separate uh, religious institutions. Um, do you know that America is more segregated today than it was in 54, in the middle of the last century when Brown versus the Board of Education was held, heard? Uh, it's true. And, and, and these processes, by the way, are, are worldwide. It's not just as part of 
monopoly, transnational capitalism as a world system. And, 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 and these processes um, cause Lenin to argue that there are two tendencies under imperialism, right? On the one hand, unity, a tendency towards unity and a tendency towards separation. Which one do you think is primary? Unity or separation? Does anybody know? Anybody want to offer a answer? Just What's quickly, primary? Looking for raised hands. All right, uh, Elliot, I'm going to open your mic now. Hello. We can hear Hello, you. can you? Okay. Um, I think what is primary for the bourgeoisie is to separate and divide the working class like oh you you're you're you go into this this I, I don't have a good example i'm sorry but it's primary for the bourgeoisie to to divide and separate the working class and unify against the working class i that is what what that is based off of what i'm hearing okay. uh, that is all Okay, anybody else? Slide, please. Let's see if anybody else has a answer. What's primary? Unity um, or, or separation? Zach, I'm gonna open your mic now. Yeah, so I I'm gonna go. I think it's like it's the primary is to unify as a working class um against the bourgeoisie meanwhile for the bourgeoisie is to separate us very good split it right down the middle lenin argued that objectively the process of production pulling people together objectively that's primary unity unity is primary. However, that said, let's talk a little bit about the separation issue a little bit more. U.S. capitalism in the course of its development has uh, built up systems of inequality. The racist and sexist division of labor is not just about work. It's also about the denial of voting rights, the denial of abortion rights the denial of the right to education, or the denial of the right to be who you are with regard to your orientation, the right, denial of the right for equal treatment. And when we talk about rights, again, we're talking about democracy, aren't we? Isn't it therefore the case that the class struggle in this country is deeply intertwined with the struggle for democracy and equal rights. And that's because the struggle between the two main classes is disfigured by racism and sexism. And the working class has to address this disfigurement. Our party has always argued that the way to address it is to fight tooth and nail um, against this unequal treatment. And you have to do it up front. And you have to do it all the time. Back in the day, when they were organizing the CIO, people of color had to be admitted to the unions, black workers. You know, back in the day, even before that, women had to have the right to vote, period, end of story. Abortion rights today have to have it. No discussion. Segregation has to be ended. Um, and most importantly, um, past discrimination has to be made up for by taking special compensatory measures like affirmative action to address it. And right now, 
as we speak, there's a case before the Supreme Court. They're going to decide in the next couple of uh, weeks in the cases that were joined suits uh, trying to ban it at Harvard and the University of North Carolina. And, and, and if they ban it, it will completely change literally the complexion of higher education in this country. That's, that's what we're up against. You know, in, in our history, not everybody on the left has understood this. The Socialist Party back in the, during Deb's times used to hold the position, yeah, racism is bad. You know, I ain't for that. But we can't solve it until socialism. And then we'll discuss it, address it, to which the communist answered that approach. You'll never get to socialism. Why? Because the class will stay divided and the bosses will continue to pit worker against worker. This issue comes up over and over and over again, ad nauseum, you know, in the initial stages of the Sanders campaign back in 2016, it came up, comes up in the debate around the 1619 project. If you follow that, you know, in the origins of what we call ruling class racism in the United States, it comes up in the debate over critical race theory what books you have in your library, uh, school library, or even in the use of the term identity politics, which I do not like that term, that somehow when people of color or women or LGBTQ people demand equality, that this is divisive uh, or a concession to liberalism. Some would be Communists even want to call it revisionism. I, we posted a meme on Instagram the other day celebrating Pride Month, revolutionary pride, right? And some fools, your pardon, but that's what I think they are. They they said, no, nah, this it's not about class. It's not about class. This is gay rights. First of all, it's not true. It is about class. But even if it wasn't, so what? So what? Aren't we opposed to oppression from whatever source it comes from? I mean, identity politics, my foot. Did you forget that one half of the working class in this country are women? Did you not hear that in 20 years, half the people in this country are gonna be black or brown? Did you not get the memo the other day that, that for the first time in, really not the first time, but the, the, the majority of children in this country were people of color? I say it's not the first time because before colonialism, majority Native American. I mean, wake up. Come out that dream world. Forgive me. So the class struggle and the fight for equality are deeply related, which brings us to proposition number five. And, and proposition number five holds that the class struggle and the struggle for democracy, though intertwined, are not the same. Slide, please. The aim of the class struggle, the program argues, is to subordinate capital to the will of labor. That's what we're trying to do. We want to dominate it. 
We want to overcome it. And then we want to abolish capital in its present form, right? We want to take private capital amassed in the means of production and make it public. The aim of the democratic struggle is to advance equality in all forms, right? Where do they come together? They come together in the fight for class unity. Why? Because the democratic struggle, fight for democracy, brings together the working class and other class and social forces. It is where alliances and coalitions are built and take place of necessity, you know, around elections, around the fight for health care, around the environment, around the struggle for peace, around campaigns against racist police murder, around trans rights, you know, you name it. You gotta work with other people, you know, from other organizations and, and, and movements, you know, and, and, and the labor movement and the women's movement and the African-American, Latino, Asian, all of us have to come together. And so we see the interplay uh, between these different um, forces. It is on this basis, comrades, that the program puts places its six propositions that the struggle for democracy, listen to this, that the struggle for democracy, it argues, is the main uh, vehicle through which the class struggle in all of its many forms takes place. Slide, please. Here's what it says. The struggle to defend and enlarge democracy, I'm quoting it now, I ain't making this up. The struggle to defend and enlarge democracy in every realm of life is therefore the only path to socialism in our country. And then they pause and say, any other path will fail and is politically indefensible. Now that, y'all, is one hell of a statement. But you got to think about it. What are the other paths? You know, what you going to do? You going to organize a general strike? Somebody wrote to us. He said, Joe Rosanna, why come y'all ain't calling for a general strike? We said, well, first of all, we're not a trade union. <laughs> trade unions have to call call for it, you know. Communists in the trade unions can can lead it, but that's not the role of the party. Um is it you wanna form a militia? Is that the way it's going to happen? You're going to uh, utilize the strategy of people's war? Is that what you're going to do against the United States Armed Forces? Um, you're going to surround the cities from the countryside? Is that what your strategy is, you know? That must be ideas that are pulled forward by people that live in the cities. They must have never been to certain sections of the U.S. countryside, some of which is Trump country. I mean, it's fair to ask, what is your strategy? You don't like ours? What's yours? You know, it's for this reason that the communist movement has put forward 
a strategy that charged the general direction of how the fight for democracy unfolds. Does anybody know what that strategy is called? Question. Um, Lou, uh, yeah, what do we, we call our strategy to charge how the struggle for democracy unfolds? It, are you asking me? Or would you I'm like asking to? You to open up the mic? All right. Um, Jim, I'm going to open up your mic. Jim, just um, isn't, it the, isn't it the United Front strategy? Is what we're. Right. Thank you, right. Jim. Anyone else? All right, Ugo, I'm going to open your mic. I think the party program calls it the anti monopoly strategy. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Um, Peggy, I'm going to open your mic. All you have to do is open your mic. Well, uh, yeah, I think of it as United Front, too. Or sometimes we engage in electoral politics, but I, and, and we and we come to the support of anybody whose democratic rights are threatened. I don't know, Joe, is there a, a good term for this beyond help, help us? I call it doing the right thing. <laughs> That's very doing, nice. <laughs> doing the right thing. That's what I call it. Slide, please. Y'all hit the nail on the head. United Front Strategy. We seek and 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 you know the the united front strategy has different forms you know one of it is the all people's front or people's front which is what we employ now against the extreme right which is kind of a multi-class approach um there's the anti-monopoly strategy which we'll talk about in uh just a moment which calls for the uh, uh strategies which will aim to build a coalition that grip of monopoly capital, the big businesses on the political structures of the country. But let's first talk about the United Front uh, a strategy. We seek unity of action on issues regardless of political persuasion. We'll, if, you, if we can agree, and that includes people who are influenced by, you know, negative ideas, you know, racist ideas, sexist ideas. You know, how do you think they built the CIO if they didn't work with people like that? You know? How do you think Lenin and them, or Fidel and them, or Ho Chi Minh and them, uh, or even Mao Zedong and them won their revolution they didn't work with people who had backward thinking? Our goal is to work towards a broad coalition led by the working class with the aim of breaking the grip of the right wing on the political structures of the country, on Congress, on the courts, on the presidency. And in doing so, to use Lenin's phrase, we, we are trying constantly to put a working class stamp on that fight. By stamp, we mean by raising uh, working class issues. This coalition, we think, will need to use all the tools in the toolbox in order to get there. Strikes, boycotts, occupations, voting. It is clear it will require a radical reform of the political system, voting in the first place getting rid of the electoral college, expanding the Supreme Court. We'll have to get statehood for DC. DC federal enclave now, you people don't really have any right to vote. I mean, you can vote, but the Congress can overturn it. Um, uh, it will require the creation of a third anti-monopoly party led by the labor movement, an alliance with people of color, women, LGBTQ, youth, and so on. 
this um, anti-monopoly party will in turn, and this is a little bit speculative, I must admit, because you really don't know how things are going to turn out. Um, but you got to have a plan. And as Johnny Cochran used to say, you got to stick to it. And then you got to improvise as things change, you know? This anti-monopoly party will, in turn, after defeating the right, will work towards electing an anti-monopoly government. The goal of that government will be to free the country, as I was just saying, from domination by the transnational monopolies. It won't be socialism, but neither will it be social democracy. It will be what we call an advanced democracy, a um, working class led multiracial people's democracy in the direction of socialism. And, 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 and we think that this anti-monopoly government will lay the basis for working class power and socialism. In other words, it will lay the basis for a leap in political and economic power. In other words, a social revolution. Which brings us to the last proposition, proposition number eight. And that is to achieve all of this, we, we have to have a much bigger, a much stronger, a, a mass communist party. You know, the two concepts of the party the first was advanced by Lenin and them in 1903 to 1905 was Cadre Party, an organization of highly disciplined professional revolutionaries. We're still in favor of discipline and being professional in our work. But we realized, the communist movement realized, particularly in the developed, that you need a mass party in order to carry successfully the fight for socialism. And that in that fight, you, you, you have to win over the majority of the working class. You know, um, um, this, our movement has to be a movement of tens of millions, you know? Um, and that leads us to how the party program conceptualizes the, the party and its role. The program envisions a party that takes initiative on all fronts. When the working class and people, trade unions, mass organizations take initiative, we join with them. Strike support, fighting racist police murder, fighting for abortion rights, uh, fighting for peace, you know. But when initiative is not taken, for whatever reason, keeping in tune with what's happening on the ground, we also have the ability to seize the moment. Or as Bobby Seale used to say, seize the time. And in concert with others, take initiative ourselves. Slide, please. In the course of these uh, activities, the program argues that, that we have three priorities, three main things that we try to do. Does anybody know what they are? What are the three main strategic um, issues, things that, that the, that, that guide the work of the party. Luke, you want to open the mic? Yep. <clears throat> I'm just looking for raised hands. So once again, click the icon showing the raised hand to do so. Um, I'm going to call on Rebecca 
Rebecca, I'm unmuting you now. Just open your mic on your end and you'll be able to speak. Um, yeah, um, I'm just taking a stab at this, but would one of the priorities just be um, trying to raise class consciousness between all workers? Um, that's the only one I can think of. Excellent. All right. Next, I'm going to call on Ugo. I'm opening your mic now. One moment. There we go. Sorry, I did it again. I didn't lower my hand after uh, being called on the last time. Sorry about that. All right. I'm going to call on Mosin. I'm opening your mic now. Just open your mic on your end, Mosin, and you'll be able to speak. And another important issue is the, is the, is the necessity of building the common uh, or party of the working class and they are led by the working class. That is absolutely necessary for the for for, for leading the revolution and building socialism. Ideological. Very good. Right. Anyone else? All right, um, Alexis, I am opening your mic now. Hi. Yes, I think the uh, one of the three priorities would also be class unity as well. There's a lot of division in the working class right now, so I think that would be important. Oh, y'all, uh, um, you know, right on the target, Johnny on the spot, they used to say, the three main things, one, the first is to build unity. Unity is our watchword. You find no other organization I don't think in this country we will um, push for fight for the unity of the class um, like 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 we do. Um, unity on the issues, uh, on the basis of of uh, addressing the concerns of of all of the dis disparate groups and the not unity in general, but unity on the basis of raising the issues that will bring everybody together and that means you know um taking up issues of race and gender and orientation so not pushing them away and not viewing them as divisive building broad unity fighting for working class leadership number two slide uh number three let's show uh and as we build broad unity uh, and fight for working class leadership, we use, we employ what we call the communist plus, right? Um, raise class consciousness, as, as uh, Rebecca said. Uh, ideologically, we, we raise socialist consciousness. We fight for reforms with others. Um, and while marching beside them around the issues that are important, we point out that unless we replace that, that, that these problems are endemic to capitalism, they're created by capitalism. And that in order to solve them permanently, we need a socialist. Uh, system. So, again, the four uh, basic uh, themes to the program, um, um, and then within uh, theme number one is the class struggle, and the working class runs throughout the program. Theme number two is the battle for democracy. Theme number three is that that battle for democracy takes place within the context of coalition building. Um, and that within that coalition building, 
the role of the party is to fight for its unity and at the same time to employ the communist plus to help raise class and socialist consciousness. Well, let's stop there and, and see if there are any other outstanding questions. We have 10 minutes left before the end of this session. Um, Luke? All right. If you have any comments or questions you'd like to ask, just once again, raise your hand to uh, indicate that you'd like to speak, um, at which point I will open the microphone on your on my end here. You'll just have to open it on your end. And uh, once again, if you could just keep your comments to uh, one minute or less, it would be greatly appreciated. I'm going to call on uh, Sharon. Sharon, I'm opening your mic now. Thank you. I, I just wanted to address something that was mentioned early on. Um, someone, one of the participants said that some of us don't produce surplus value. And I think what they were referring to was all kinds of service workers, right, who are not on the uh, producing an actual product that capital turns around and sells for a profit. But the fact is that everyone in the working class produces surplus value, contributes to the profit of capital. For example, someone who's a childcare worker, what, what are they doing? They're helping working people go to work because they provide care for the children. And of course, the cost of that lands back on the, wor on the worker and is rarely subsidized by capital. But we the we childcare workers are produ are helping to produce surplus value. So I think we need to look at the working class as a whole in its relationship to capital and understand that the definition of the working class are is anyone who has only their labor power to sell. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to call on Lowell. Lowell, I'm opening your mic now. Aloha, Joe. I'm just curious, um, your position or the party's position um, in terms of the working class and where you would center police. Um, and I mean by police, the local police, um, FBI, INS, blah, blah, blah. Um, where would you, because there's a controversy right now of it's being Pride Month, um, places like San Francisco and New York, whether police should be allowed to participate in our parade. Um, what's your thoughts on this? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, let me look here. Melissa, I am opening your mic now. You can go Thanks, ahead. Thanks, um, I'm wondering um, about those, the people that they have children, um, but they're not working. They're receiving like funds, like public aid. How do we incorporate them into this process? Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to take one more, Joe? Okay. All right, Larry, I'm gonna open your mic. Yes, hello. I like to sometimes think in concrete examples of which even this morning or yesterday, one came, which is a very negative Supreme Court decision descended by only on the new justice, um, uh, Latanji Brown Jackson, whereby labor unions would be harshly penalized for any strike activity. This is a traditional uh, uh, mainstream activity of organized labor to withhold their labor, since we're speaking about that when conditions demand. A second one is having municipal uh, control over some facilities. In, uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, there's an attempt by a progressive mayor to have the electric utility municipalized rather than in expensive private hands. A third one, of course, is rent control. And here in New York City, there's been a very sincere and, and powerful struggle 
to maintain rent control and the New York Housing Authority in decent condition, all of which uh, is very important to housing for those in the working class. This has been historical, and I think reasoning our strategy through specific tactics uh, is also important as we go forward. Okay, are there any other, Lou? Yeah, there's a few more raised hands now. Um, Diane, I'm gonna open your mic. Just open your mic on your end, Diane. All right, um, I'm going to open Christian's mic. Christian, just open your mic on your end, there you go. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, uh, my question is, there's a lot of communist organizations out there that uh, believe that only a violent armed revolution will um, affect the transition to communism. Um, I understand the party um, has a different view on this, and I was wondering, what would it look like uh, for a peaceful um, uh, capture of the means of production? Thank you. Right. You want to take one more, Joe? Okay. All right. Uh, Peggy, I'm opening your mic. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, I had lots of questions I entered in the, th I, I don't think I'll add any more here. All right. Oh, I can respond, yeah, to the person who, on surplus value. Um, there are the difference between the surplus value is greater if you're adding more value measured in money. That That's the problem. All right, um, would you like to respond, Joe? Okay, well, there, there are a lot of questions, um, some of which go beyond the uh, scope of this uh, presentation. Um, I agree very much uh, with the uh, comrade who said that everybody produces value, whether it's material or immaterial, really doesn't matter so much. Our views have changed on on that um, over the course of the uh, years, you know, um, because in increasingly value is taking immaterial form. I, I can't remember the last time I used, uh, you know, paper money, you know, I normally use credit or debit cards. To, so everybody, but we should have a class on, on, uh, political economy that will go deeper into these uh, issues. For the point of view of this discussion, anybody who um, sells their ability to work is a worker, from uh, the point of view of the party program. And if you buy, if you purchase that ability, you're a capitalist, whether you're a big one or a small one. Uh, and, and people who are on public aid, uh, a part of the working class, you know? Because uh, everybody knows you don't make enough, you know, on uh, assistance to get by. So you got to do a little extra in order to to uh, to uh, make it. <clears throat> and they, a lot of people come in and out, you know, of the uh, employed and, but the unemployed are part of <laughs> the uh, the working class, even if they do our jobs, you know. Um, back home, a lot of them call themselves, we call ourselves, it's not necessarily independent contractors. Lo, those people are already at the demonstrations. <laughs> They're at every demonstration. You're talking about the state and and uh, FBI, CIA, police. These, you know, I mean, they're they're part of the, and their function and goal is to protect 
you know, capital to protect the protect the uh, state, even when they're democratic minded, you know, um, the mayor of New York just made a former cop, you know, former Republican, vicious anti-communist speech on, on um, uh, Labor Day. People in the military are somewhat different. Military is a little bit, a little bit uh, different, you know. And uh, you know, uh, those are mainly you know working class people. Who, but uh, when you're talking about these agencies, it's a whole nother uh, ball game. Um, on the uh, transition to uh, socialism, you know. I want to encourage everybody to read Frederick Engels. And I got to end with this because it's 1230. Last preface written by Engels to Karl Marx's Civil War in France. It was written in 1895. You look it up on the Marxist internet archive, you're likely to find one. That's not the one. <laughs> or you can go to the party website. It's um, uh, we 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 published it. And Engels was a military. In addition to other things, uh, that was one of his specialty. They called him the general. And in that essay, he talks about the transitions and forms of a uh, struggle. Um, and he puts forward the concept of a peaceful. Uh, transition that he and Marx, you know, thought was a was a uh, a possibility. Um, but what we imagine is that this will be a protracted, long-term, very militant uh, series of events, um, uh, including uh, strikes and occupations. Um, and uh, demonstrations and elections and a wrestling of power from the uh, ruling classes. It, it will involve compulsion and force because there are violent forms of force and there are nonviolent forms of force. And it definitely will re re require nonviolent a strike, for example. One recent historic example, if you look at the transition process in South Africa, when the African majority took power from the white minority, you'll see an example of a relatively peaceful uh, transition of, of power, not in terms of private property yet, but in terms of political power, and it worked there. Um, well, that's all I can say uh, for the moment. Thank you, comrades, very much for listening. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Logan. Um, um, not Logan. Um, thank you for the uh, uh, producers. Thank you, uh, Dee. And um, we'll see you, um, if not uh, over the course of the summer at the Little Red Schoolhouse, we'll see you at the convention. We break now for a half hour and then the class starts at uh, one. Thank you, Joe. You and uh, participants don't need to go anywhere. We hope you'll stay uh, with us for the uh, next class, which will begin uh, at the top of the hour at this point. Uh, so thank you, Joe. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Luke. Thank you to all of the participants. Uh, I think we could have uh, stayed in this discussion for another several hours but, <laughs> but we don't have uh uh that kind of opportunity right now so maybe we'll create more opportunities in the in the future but thank you everyone